Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today, we're really going to discuss a topic that seems to be coming up more and more in our interactions with our nursing homes across the seven states we service. And that's really how do we start to look at providing COVID vaccinations inside and internally? So when we're looking at that, we're really looking at the administering, the proper storage, and also recording of that information with state immunization databases. And when we look at kind of where we're going and as we move forward through this pandemic, you know, we're seeing issues with frequencies of clinics and not having the vaccine really available in the moment you need it, especially with quarantine protocols that have been put in place and guidance for new admissions that are not up to date and moving forward. It's crucial to be able to have access to that vaccination to be able to appropriately provide it and document as you go forward. So this is gonna help not only to improve your uptake percentages for vaccinations and boosters, um, but it's also gonna help to reduce those unnecessary quarantines for your new residents. Today, we brought on board with us Dr. Matthew Barnett. Uh, he is the Director of Clinical Operations for Geico Healthcare. They are a long-term long -term care pharmacy provider and uh, excited to have Matthew on with us today. Um, at the end, we'll have some Q&A. We've also had Dr. Swati Gar here with us to be able to answer anything from a medical director perspective in the home. So without further ado, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matthew Burnett. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Glad to be here with you guys today. Um, so to enter into the discussion. Uh, so I'm kind of calling this demystifying COVID-19 vaccine storage requirements and reporting and general challenges that present themselves with this rollout. Um, so being a long-term care provider and a vaccine provider for our facilities, I am very uh, much aware of all the challenges that many of you are probably facing and kind of the pitfalls, I guess, that you're running into. I do believe, as Jeremy mentioned, that moving to having vaccine on hand or at least a partnership with a pharmacy to have it a little more readily available will significantly help you guys and lessen some of that stress. So I'm just kind of going to go through a few scenarios of uh, which way you can go, because there's a couple of different options to make that happen. And they have they both have kind of pluses and minuses there. Um, so for me, the most common, just to kind of speak in general terms. So from the pharmacy standpoint right now, when we dispense a COVID vaccine, the main issue is still being that the manufacturers of COVID vaccines are making those into large doses, large vials. So when you're having new admissions for one or two people, it makes it kind of difficult to be able to send out a vial to justify one or two people. So the federal government says that it's okay to you know, use it even for one dose. However, the CDC and your local Department of Health may have you sign off on something that says you're not going to waste vaccine. So you kind of play a tricky game there. Uh, that's one that we run into a lot. Uh, and we try and kind of just get, you know, enough people that we think it justifies sending it out. Uh, for your in the facilities, once you're able to actually get it in the facility, that'll be up to, you know, the your staff and you on that. Um, I can tell you that we have not really had any pushback or uh, negative issues or anything like that from having sent out, you know, one or two doses and wasting the rest. Um, but it is something that they do look at. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the couple of options. So as I said, there are kind of two pathways to be able to get vaccine in your facility. Uh, the first and easiest one, in my opinion, is to partner with a pharmacy your current pharmacy provider or another pharmacy provider that is able to send it to you guys and let you handle it. So the way that we have our, our set up is we actually get our vaccinations from the federal government's federal retail plan. Uh, a lot of other pharmacies get theirs from the Georgia Department of Health and it comes with its own restrictions, which I'll kind of discuss. Uh, but for the federal retail program, we are actually able to partner directly with uh, facilities. There's a bit of paperwork to fill out uh, to sign up to show that you have the correct storage requirements and those sort of things. And after that, and we have that done, we're able to actually ship that out kind of as needed. We just need a day or two notice to kind of ship the vaccine there with our normal medication deliveries. It seems to be going well for most people that are doing that. So first thing to know is or ask your pharmacy is, do they receive their vaccine supply from the state or from federal resources? If it's from federal resources, there's only a little bit of paperwork that's needed. And after that, 
they will be able to share vaccine supplies with you. Uh, and then you actually don't have to store it a lot on hand and I'll go into storage and stuff, but it, it does help out. Uh, if they do have a state supply that they get from the Department of Public Health, I know, for instance, Georgia, if a pharmacy gets their supply from the Department of Public Health in Georgia, they are not allowed to set up secondary sites at all. Uh, some, I imagine that's going to change soon, and some of your states may be different than that, but uh, I do encourage that you check on that particular thing. But if it is from a, a federal allocation, then there are no problems with sharing that with the secondary site. Uh, the next question is going to be which vaccine do they have? The does the pharmacy have? So storage requirements are significantly different between those. Um, we'll go ahead and talk about J&J. &J. It's no longer authorized for booster. And since that's mostly what we're talking about, you, it's pretty much out of the conversation. Uh, it is limited use for other situations. From the beginning, if someone has an allergy to an mRNA or something like that, otherwise CDC really doesn't recommend its use anymore. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get that one done. So Moderna is probably the easiest and most user-friendly storage vaccine for you guys. Um, it is stored in the in the freezer at the pharmacy, and then it can be taken out of the out of the freezer and stored in a fridge for up to thirty days. So it's really good for shipping to and from the facility and stuff like that, or to the facility from the pharmacy. It really lends well to that. Uh, Pfizer is required to be in an ultra cold storage container. So some of the pharmacies have, pharmacies have those. Uh, you had to special buy those if you didn't already have one. And not a lot of people have stocked the Pfizer just for that reason. Um, it is, there are ways that you can store it in your, with a partnership with a pharmacy that you could bring it into your community and store it. Uh, it can be stored in a regular freezer for 14 days. And then before dilution, it can actually be left in a refrigerator for 30 days. But with the Pfizer, you run into the pitfalls of the dilution. So it has to be mixed and diluted prior to administration. And then also the cold storage and stuff like that. If you're trying to just keep it on hand uh, for six months or whenever until it's good. Uh, you can kind of run into issues there. Other issues are the vial sizes. So Moderna has about 20 booster doses in it. Uh, usually 18 to 20 is about the most you can get out of there or a 10 of the regular doses. So it's, uh, you know, when you're committing a lot of doses to that, if you're actually, um, if you're going to be using that one, I apologize. Uh, so that one expires after two hours at room temp or at 12 hours if it's kept in the refrigerator. So it, again, it's pretty good for if you're doing a booster clinic inside of your facility. Um, and then Pfizer. So Pfizer has about five regular booster doses, regular doses or booster doses. So it's a lot more user friendly to say, hey, I only have two residents. I'm gonna only waste three vaccines. Uh, I can go ahead and use this one. It's really no problem. Again, the storage on that one's not too bad. It expires after six hours after you dilute it, if it's in the fridge, about 30 minutes if you use it immediately. So if you are going to, the other issue I'll talk about in a minute on the, the storage and ordering on those guys, uh, to set up a secondary site, as it's called, or a pharmacy, there is a section B paperwork. There's a CDC, um, provider agreement that I referenced that it's the same paperwork for both situations, uh, regardless of which path you take. But the section B part is what you fill out if you actually want to become a secondary site for a pharmacy. Um, if you do become that, some things that you would need to report with IIS reporting capabilities, um, that has to be done daily and, uh, whenever you do vaccines, it has to be done within 24 hours per the CDC recommendations. You have to fill out your storage capacity and the temperature that it can, you can hold vaccines at. You have to tell them about your storage equipment, uh, what kind of refrigerator or freezer you're using, the make and the model. And you also have to fill out some attestation forms that say that this uh, device is going to stay at the correct recommended temperature range. Another thing that they do recommend is that you get a temperature data logger if you don't already have one, which is pretty much a uh, 
thermometer that sits in the fridge that just kind of tests the temperature constantly, and you can keep a log of that. If you have any vaccines in your building, it's really a good idea to have on there anyways. Um, save you in the long run. I know we've already used ours quite a few times that it saved us for in other fridges because we bought a few of them. So uh, another thing, if you do go the pharmacy route is to designate an employee to be in charge of the vaccine program. This seems to help tremendously if just one point of contact for the facilities working with one point of contact at the pharmacy to just organize everything and get it ordered and sent and the paperwork back and forth being done. Uh, some of the things that an employee in charge may end up working on, so they'll order from the pharmacy. Uh, they'll say, hey, I have three or four residents or we're anticipating residents throughout this week. We want to go ahead and order some from you and have it on hand for when they get here, that sort of thing. Um, they're responsible for receiving the vaccine shipment, so whenever it actually gets there, they make sure that it gets put into the appropriate refrigerator with the appropriate temperature and everything. Uh, organizing and acquiring consent forms. Uh, so consent forms and all that paperwork is still required to be done and actually is going to end up back at the pharmacy, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the reporting to IIS, that is covered by the pharmacy if you do enter into a partnership with one. Uh, the billing is also done by the pharmacy. We just have to have the billing data and that sort of thing. Uh, and then reporting adverse reactions or issues to what the federal government set up called VAERS, V-A-E-R-S. So that would be something that an employee at the facility would be responsible for doing. So after that, um, that's kind of it for that pathway. So pretty much you set up a partnership with the pharmacy and the pharmacy is gonna be responsible for storing the vaccine shipping you the vaccine, they will provide supplies and stuff that comes along with the vaccinations. They will also be responsible for uploading to the IIS program and for doing the billing. Uh, we have, some people may set up a partnership where they say, hey, if you administer it, you know, your nurse administers it, then we are willing to pay you a certain amount or something like that. Um, but that's all up to you guys to kind of work out there. But the pharmacy is able to kind of help with the paperwork and generate all those things. So it does take a little bit of work off of the facility itself. So if the you guys at the facility want to become your own provider, uh, the CDC makes it pretty easy to set that up. Um, I have a link here, but if you go to their website and you look for CDC provider vaccinations, then you can actually set that up uh, pretty easily. They have all the information as you go down so you'll complete a COVID-19 vaccination program agreement. Uh, you will have an employee, preferably kind of the same person you would have as your pharmacy contact. They'll have to go through training and education modules. There's a few of them. There's best immunization practices uh, for healthcare providers, uh, specifics on the Moderna vaccine, specifics on the Pfizer vaccine, uh, temperature storage and vaccine storage, just general, that kind of stuff. Uh, you will need to have the IIS requirements and have the capability of being able to upload those within 24 hours. And someone has to, every day, has to go into CCC, CDC's website and upload the inventory of whatever amount of vaccine you have left, as well as your local health department may do, may do that as well, or have you do some of that. For us, it's daily, and for Georgia, it's kind of the same way. You still have to upload for both of them. Um, you'd have to have a billing set up for that because you are able to build Part D plans for it. Some of them are not paying very well, um, but there is some money to be made from, from that. But that is, in addition to that, so some of the things that I talked about from the pharmacy standpoint, you would still, you'd end up doing those if you did your own storage as well. So you'd, you'd still be worrying about the storage requirements, the vial sizes. Um, one thing that I did want to mention that I skipped earlier was Moderna is very user friendly as far as when you order it. If you do become your own facility, your own provider, you're able to order it in 100 doses at a time, which is about 10 vials. So it makes it quite a bit easier. The problem with Pfizer is, is if you do order it, it comes in doses of 100 and 
1,187 doses per pallet, uh, which makes it extremely difficult to store and to use within that short time frame if you're going to keep it in a regular freezer, if you're going to keep it in the fridge or something like that. Uh, you may run into wasting a very large amount of doses. Uh, I really anticipate the next six months or a year that the vaccine manufacturers are going to have to start going to some sort of a single dose uh, COVID-19 shot in order to make it feasible at all for us. They haven't done that yet at all. Um, but last time I asked one of them about it, it was kind of a need that they knew about, but nothing they were actively working on. And that was about six or eight months ago. So I'm still hopeful that that'll help, that'll work out and that would help uh, all of us significant. We've been able to just send out kind of like a pneumovax or something, you know, hey, this patient needs this and we send it out specifically for that patient. But that is hopefully in the future. But that is a rundown of kind of the two pathways you can take to get vaccine in your building. Either to kind of summarize, there's the path where you partner with a pharmacy that is a federal provider that's able to set you up as a secondary site. Uh, the other option is to become yourselves a vaccine provider. Uh, CDC has lots of documentation on how to do that and where to go about it um, and go from there. But that's about it, Jeremy. Thanks so much for that information on that end of it. Um, and, and kind of letting us know about those two different pathways. So, and just to make sure I kind of got it as I was taking yep. some notes as I'm educating myself here too. Okay. It, you know, the first path is really more in partnership with your long-term care pharmacy. Yeah. That takes some of the paperwork burden and some of the other things that are behind it off of you and allows you to really do that administration um, without having as many things versus becoming the true provider, correct? That's exactly right. Yep. Yep. So there are a couple paths, and I, I will share for everyone in the call. Uh, Alliant did go ahead, and we put together a one-page document on this that will cover all seven states we represent, and it has the um, the IIS, the immunization registry is basically we have that um, available that will link you to the registry, also to the proper email and phone contacts for your state if this is a channel you want to explore in that sense. Also, you can reach out to Alliant at booster at AlliantHealth.org and we can help to answer questions for you and also bring things back around on that end of it. Um, one question that I was kind of thinking of as we were going through it, Matthew, was have you had any like from the homes in which you, you I know you said you were out touring some yourself, um, best practices for storage in the home, like as far as keeping it or, um, models that would be something you would want to follow. I know you talked about having an individual in the home kind of being the responsible party for yeah. all pieces of this. Is right. there anything that sticks out in particular for you in that side? Yeah, designating like a fridge and um, to be like the, all right, all of our COVID vaccines are going to go into this refrigerator. Uh, we're going to have this particular storage device to stay on on the side of it, like a like I said, a temperature data logger that kind of continuously monitors, um, not just kind of throwing it in with the other meds and stuff like that. Because although we do log it, you know, that's a, as part of a pharmacy audit and everything else, it it's not quite as uh, you know everybody doesn't pay attention quite as much to that one as they do the one with the COVID vaccines and everything. Um, yeah, having a point of contact, honestly, the ones that I we have quite a few facilities that are doing this with us. Uh, they seem to really like it uh, for exactly reasons that we're talking about it. You know, it's more convenient. They can kind of pull residents and order it ahead of time and have it on hand to do a booster clinic a week later because uh, they are good for 30 days in the fridge, both vaccines. So they do lend well to that. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. We also have Dr. Gar on with us, who is medical director for Alliant, but also over several long term care facilities. And Dr. Gar, I believe that this is something that your own facilities participate in. Is that correct? Can you give us a little insight on your side? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our facility is actually a hospital affiliated facility. And, uh, you know, when the vaccine allocation happened initially, I know that the lo a lot of facilities had that pharmacy partnership. Ours actually was pulled. Our vaccines were pulled into the hospital vaccine. So we have been having to uh, in-house 
um, that process ourselves. And while it was initially, um, you know, we thought that, you know, it was a little challenging to set up because of the, you know, more restrictive uh, way that the vaccines were being given out initially. I think it um, lent itself well to that ongoing, um, you know, vaccine administration, not just for, I would say, not just for the residents, but also for the staff. So the way that we um, are able to do something like that is actually we will uh, look at the number of residents who, um, you know, especially the short stay residents, when they're coming to us, we are making sure that we have either one or two clinics, um, you know, a week. Um, ideally, you know, typically we have one clinic a week, um, but that's how we actually ended up um, having such high rates of even staff vaccination because once we open a vial, the DONs will communicate to all staff members that, you know, we have a vial open and we have, you know, two, two vaccines left or three vaccines left. Does anyone else want to have a booster? And, you know, soon enough, we'll have a, you know, a bunch of staff lined up saying, you know, just give me the booster today. Um, so that, that actually helps. And, you know, um, uh, to Matthew's point, I think it is so incredibly important to have an owner of that process. So our ownership is really our consultant pharmacist, which is your, I mean, we, facilities best friend, <laughs> uh, to be honest, have your consultant pharmacist and then pair them with either your DON or, um, you know, your IP to make sure that, you know, that flow of um, vaccines is, um, is established. So, um, essentially what happens is the vaccines actually get stored in our DON's office, you know, that again, having a separate fridge to make sure that you're, you know, doing that vaccine hygiene appropriately. And then that also allows for DON to know how many vaccines she has on hand and um, and then quickly be able to administer those vaccines and then fill out those vaccine cards. And then our pharmacist, consultant pharmacist, will then go in and enter it in the system. So that way we have a seamless model that we have come up with um, now for administering vaccines. One of the other things that I would say is, you know, very early on when we were giving monoclonal antibodies, as well as vaccines, you know, there was this issue of make sure that you have what we call a monoclonal antibody or a vaccine e kit on hand. So, what we did is we created a cart where um, we had the Benadryl, we had EpiPen, we had blood pressure equipment, and other devices to monitor patients after you give the vaccine. So, you know, when you have, so now it is a second nature. As soon as you bring out the vaccine, you bring out the e-kit and, you know, thankfully we have never been able to, you know, we have never had the chance to use that e-kit, but it is a good thing to have on hand as well. And, you know, one thing in, in, in our prior discussions that I, that we had had, Dr. Gar, was um, that I found interesting and, and stood out with me was, you know, you, you described some of the staff, you know, the hesitant staff that were there that what you were seeing from them were a lot of times it was literally maybe they're in a lunchroom or break room and having a conversation and then come out and say, okay, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And that was a nice way for your team to be able to actually achieve higher than average booster numbers right out of the gate, it sounded like. Absolutely. So I will, um, you know, this actually happened rec very recently where, you know, we were talking about, you know, it's just something that comes up in the talks and we were sitting down with the staff and, um, you know, we talked about, you know, the data that is out there where, you know, if your staff is not boosted or your resident is not boosted and they are ready for a booster and they didn't receive the booster, you have no protection against Omicron. So I was just, you know, talking about it. Maybe the staff went and, you know, talked in the lunch room next thing there is a set set of like five staff members who are like i want it now so you know you always have to realize that there is that window of opportunity with your staff that you have where you can really you know they want it it's like me you know when i want the flu vaccine or any other vaccine i want it now i always tell my staff members that when i come into the facility if you have to give me that annual even the annual flu vaccine i'm like just as soon as i walk in just hit me up with a flu vaccine because i'm not going to take time to you know i have 
50 million things to do, you know, our staff members have the same, you know, they would probably not take that time later on. So to have that on hand, your staff booster and vaccine rates will go up. That is for sure. Great. We have just a couple minutes left. If anyone has a question, um, please pop it into the Q and A section or into the chat, and we'll be happy to be able to address that for you. I will remind you that um, I highly suggest you download the presentation here because we're going to include in that a one pager that includes all seven states with your priority contacts and kind of how to start and take that initial step in engaging in this process to be able to kind of go forward on that. There, you know, as we look at the big picture and we kind of go forward. You know, I'll kind of reiterate what I started with, you know, this is really a, a great way if we look at, you know, how long we've been dealing with COVID and I think we've all come to the realization that it's going to be part of our lives in one way, shape or form for the near for the future. So we have to start preparing our homes in that same way. And we spoke to that before, like, how do we build COVID and protocols into our daily practices and really bringing this process back in house is more than likely going to be 1 of those next stages especially with the most recent CDC changes or anticipated changes coming out where when you have a resident that's been in the hospital and is being referred to you that is vaccinated and is boosted, but their booster occurred more than four months prior and they're over the age of 50, that person is no longer considered up to date under those terms. So therefore, you're having to put that individual into quarantine. They may or may not choose to be able to come to your home. However, if you can partner with your hospital, number one, try to get them boosted before they even leave the door. And number two, remember that if you have it in your home, you can go and actually administer the vaccination right then and there. And by CDC's terms and definitions, they are up to date in that moment. And the additional protocols, transmission-based protocols you're having to put around them, you're gonna be able to take back. So you're gonna have less chance for a issue with someone being non-compliant, which could create survey problems for you in the building less PPE burn rates and issues associated with that side of it. You're going to have uh, new residents that are going to be much happier with their stay because they're going to be able to fully participate in activities and also in their therapeutics and therapies of why they're there in the first place. And there's just a, a whole slew of benefits that come from that. So just take those things into mind as you kind of look at the programs. Um, we're hoping to put out some additional information on this to be able to help you. And, you know, Matthew brought up one other piece that I really didn't examine on this, but there is a possible somewhat revenue stream from administration side on that, depending upon how you are. So um, if we don't have any questions, I'd like to just thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we'll be putting out that one pager on this also on our website within the next 24 hours. We'll have that posted out there for you and thank you for attending our boost live event. So thank you very much to, uh, um, to Matthew and to Dr. Gar for joining us and uh, everyone have an awesome day today. Thanks. Thank you.